my name is Emily Max. I work as a researcher at the Geneva Academy, and I will be saying a few introductory words before giving the floor to our director, Professor Gloria Edjoli. Um, so as some of you might be aware, the Geneva Academy regularly, regularly sorry, organizes events like this one. We call them the IHL Talks. They happen six to seven times a year, and they're aimed at discussing pressing, contemporary, and or politically relevant humanitarian topics. Um, we've chosen to um, do two days panels, obviously, because it is very contemporary, because the decision of the European Court of Human Rights is recent and it was delivered at the end of January. So we wanted to provide a platform for reacting and reflecting on the decision that has been awaited for a very long time. And that is full also of very interesting novel and controversial already um, substantial insights. Just so you know, we're always looking for interesting themes for um, our next events in the IHL talk series. So if you have any suggestions, requests, comments, or even complaints, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to the Academy. Um, we have either contacting me directly or the, our events team, all email addresses are on the website. Um, and on, you know, housekeeping rules, by now I hope um, that you're, we're all familiar with Zoom, uh, but for, um, um, cybersecurity reasons very relative. Um, we have only allowed the microphones and the cameras of our panelists to work. You can interact uh, with our panelists through the chat feature, and that's how um, Professor Gadjoli will um, handle the Q&A later on. So without further ado, um, I look forward to today's discussions and give the floor to you, Gloria. Thank you very much, uh, Emily, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, so indeed, it was uh, approximately one month ago, uh, on uh, the 21st of uh, January 2021, uh, that the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights finally uh, delivered its uh, long-awaited judgment on the merits in uh, Georgia versus, versus Russia number two. Uh, in this case, uh, the court had to deal with allegations of serious violations of human rights that uh, were allegedly committed by Russia, or organized armed groups under its control in Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and the buffer zone in uh, Georgian territory. So the judgment uh, deals with two key phases of the conflict. One of active hostilities or contexts of chaos uh, to quote the court. Uh, they were characterized by bombings, shellings uh, and ground combat and they started on 8 August until the 12th of August, 2008. So five days of active hostilities. Then we had a second phase, uh, which, which started on, on the 12th of August. And uh, after that date, uh, Russia started occupying the disputed territories, uh, the separatist entities of Abkhazia and South Ossetia and the buffer zone uh, in Georgia proper. So as the judgment came out, and human rights lawyers and IHL experts jumped on it and read it avidly, full of questions such as, did the court consider that the victims fell under the jurisdiction of Russia, even though the alleged violations occurred outside its territory? In this respect, did the court further expand after the cryptic findings of the landmark Alskani case the exceptional circumstances under which jurisdiction can be established extraterritorially? Or rather, did it go backwards uh, to a more Bankovic style uh, um, judgment? Did the court find Russia responsible of human rights violations, even if they occurred in the middle of active hostilities, where IHL is usually considered as the Lex Specialis? And more broadly, did the court adopt, adopt a harmonious interpretation of the interplay between international humanitarian law and human rights law as it did in the Hassan case? Or did it rather ignore IHL as it did in the famous Isayeva cases? Did the court attribute alleged violations committed by organized armed groups to Russia? And on the right to life, did the court find both substantive and procedural violations? Uh, the extent to which uh, the obligation to investigate applies uh, in armed conflicts remains a subject of controversy. And this, in, in this case, the court had a rare opportunity to position itself on this issue in the context of an international armed conflict. As an aside, please let me uh, note 
uh, that the Geneva Academy and the International Committee of the Red Cross have published last year guidelines on investigating violations uh, of IHL, which the court apparently read and took into account. So these are just some of the questions that bubbled in our minds. And I'm extremely happy to introduce you to the wonderful panel uh, that will discuss with us today these and other issues, and who will, which will help us to really decode uh, this important judgment. So we have with us first Professor Marco Sassoli, who is professor at the University of Geneva. He's also teaching IHL at the Geneva Academy, and he was my predecessor as the director of the academy. He's a giant of IHL. Uh, oh, yes, we can say that for sure. Uh, who has uh, really commented and reflected upon the interplay between IHL and human rights law uh, for many years. Then we have Marco Milanovic, who is professor at the University of Nottingham, a friend of the Geneva Academy. He's also a worldwide expert on the extraterritorial application of human rights law. And his writings, including his numerous blogs, always managed to shed light with clarity and humor on the most intriguing current international law issues. And by the way, he published a very uh, interesting and important blog on this case, uh, Georgia versus Russia, on Agile Talk, and I highly recommend you uh, reading it. And last but not least, we have with us Isabella Rizzini, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher at Ruhr University Bochum, Germany. Uh, she has published a book in 2008 with Brill titled The Interstate Application Under the European Convention on Human Rights Between Collective Enforcement of Human Rights and International Dispute Settlement. So Isabella will be able to, to broaden up also the, the debate uh, by uh, linking up that case with other uh, interstate uh, cases before the European Court of Human Rights. So each of our panelists will have approximately 15 minutes to discuss the Georgia versus Russia case number two, and then they will answer uh, which come from the virtual floor. So please note that you can send me your questions even during the presentations of the panelists, and you can do that by using uh, the chat function. So at the end, we will select uh, the most uh, important and relevant questions, and we will have a further discussion with the panelists. So now, uh, without further delay, I give the floor to Professor Sassoli. Oh, thank you, uh, Gloria Gagioli. Uh, it's a great pleasure to speak uh, with this panel. And uh, it's an occasion for me for a coming out, uh, which I wouldn't have dared for the last 20 years. Perhaps I have to explain that the Bankovic case was seen at least in the academic circles I know as um, had similar reactions than you would have had in the gender commission of the Swedish parliament if someone had said women should take care of children and their husband and not work uh, outside. Uh, so Bankovic was seen as a very old fashioned approach. What did the court in 2001 say in the Bankovic case? So I'm not a fan. Uh, I have a lot of sympathy for Mr. Bankovic because he lost his relatives in the uh, NATO bombing in Belgrade. Uh, but uh, I have also sympathy with the court, which found his application inadmissible because the victims were not under the jurisdiction of the NATO states, which uh, bombed Belgrade. I still think, and now uh, as we are online, I don't risk that I get tomatoes and old eggs and so on. I still think that the person is not under the jurisdiction of a state merely because that state violated its human rights. The person must have been under the jurisdiction of the state a logical moment before uh, the violation occurred. Uh, this can happen through control of territory. Uh, and in my view, uh, control of territory can consist just of control of one house. It can be control of a person, 
um, anyone who is detained is obviously under the jurisdiction of the detaining power to speak in um, IHL terms. And the court also um, speaks about a nebulous stage agent authority and control factor, which I would integrate into my very functional concept of territorial control, which can be, uh, the territory can consist of one house. Therefore, as in international humanitarian law, I would distinguish conduct of hostilities and persons in the power of a party. And I agree that IHL and human rights law apply when someone is in the power of a party. Now, Marko Milanovic, uh, we, our first names are both Marko, but mine with C and his with K, um, would object that it is difficult to delineate the borderline cases to say, okay, but when is someone, when it is, a, is it a conduct of hostilities situation? And when is it a situation where the person was already somehow in the power of a party? Now, this is also a problem in international humanitarian law. I would say rather a marginal problem, but nevertheless, the rules of humanitarian law on conduct of hostilities on treatment of people in the power of a party are very different. And in law, we have plenty of such situations where at the borderline, take mandate and working contract. This is now an important issue with Uber, whether those who work for Uber um, are employees or self-employed. Well, at the borderline, it's very difficult to determine, but as far as I know, no one suggests let's abandon this distinction between uh, self-employed and employee. Now, I must, however, admit that the court in the Georgia versus Russia case got the distinction with all due respect profoundly wrong with its indiscriminate distinction between two phases. I quote the court in paragraph 144. The court concludes that the events which occurred during the active phase of hostilities 8 to 12 August did not fall within the jurisdiction of the Russian Federation for the purposes of Article 1 of the Convention. This is a terrible, sorry, oversimplification. Because in the first phase, there were many persons under the jurisdiction and in effect, fortunately, the court dealt with their cases, but with a very superficial justification. It dealt with the civilian detainees, for instance, paragraph 239, insofar as Georgian civilians were mostly detained after the hostilities had ceased, the court concludes that they fell within the jurisdiction of the Russian Federation. Does that mean that if all of them had been only detained during the hostilities, suddenly detainees would no longer benefit from the protection by the convention? Uh, what does mean mostly detained? Uh, how does one de de delineate that? And then for the prisoners of war, um, the court writes, given that they were detained, paragraph 269, given that they were detained inter alia, inter alia after the cessation of hostilities, because they were obviously also detained during hostilities, uh, the court concludes that they fell within the jurisdiction of the Russian Federation. And by the way, this is correct. Obviously, they fell in the jurisdiction. And when it comes to the right to education, um, uh, paragraph 312, given that the events in question took place in Terralia after the cessation of hostilities, the court concludes that the victims fell within the jurisdiction of the Russian Federation. Now, Therefore, the sweeping statement in paragraph 144, distinguishing the two phases, in reality 
concerns only the right to life. But even this is an oversimplification in my view, because for instance, if a person was executed in a house, once Russian or South Ossetian forces got control over the house, then obviously this is a violation. That person was under the jurisdiction and this was a violation of the right to life of that person. On the other hand, in my view, astonishingly, um, the court uh, considered that the procedural obligation to make an investigation exists even when substantive obligations did not exist. And don't think I am against investigations, but I find it very conceptually very strange that if the because the procedural, yeah, obviously, if the convention had foreseen, as some treaties foresee, an independent obligation to investigate, that could well be the case. But here, it's only a jurisprudential uh, deduction from the substantive right. And if the victim of the killing was not under the jurisdiction of a state. I cannot uh, imagine how then nevertheless that state which did not violate human rights law by killing that person has then a procedural obligation. Because why? Um, because of the special features. Well, perhaps I should first congratulate the Geneva Academy that uh, the guidelines uh, they published together with the ICSC after a long process are quoted, are referred to by uh, the court now uh, and are applied to, to the obligation to uh, make an inquiry. Now, in paragraphs 330, 331, the court uh, uh, says that a jurisdictional link in relation to the obligation to investigate could be established in respect of a debt which had occurred outside its jurisdiction if there were special features in a given case and in the present case in view of the allegations that it had committed war crimes during the active phase of hostilities, the Russian Federation had an obligation to investigate the events in issue in accordance with international humanitarian law and domestic law. I would clearly say the court does not say they have only to make an investigation on war crimes. This is simply an argument why this is a special situation. Second, the Russian Federation took steps to investigate those allegations. Third, it established effective control over the territories in question shortly afterwards. And all potential suspects among the Russian service personnel were located either in the Russian Federation or in territories under the control of the Russian Federation. And Georgia was unable to uh, investigate. Well, this list, as Marko Milanovic has mentioned, is a little troubling because we don't know. Uh, well, what would I, how would they have decided if, say, it was not about war crimes or if Russia hadn't done any investigation? And it is very strange to say, as you did an investigation, the obligation to make an investigation applied and you didn't make a sufficient investigation. Well, if you hadn't done any investigation, that would have been um, okay. Um, then, um, Obviously, there are many other problematic aspects in this judgment, including Marko Milanovic has written about that. Uh, the, the question, is, it a, um, is Russia responsible because the South Ossetian forces are attributable to Russia? This is what we would expect with all respect for the court, every student to do first, to say, uh, who is Russia responsible because those who acted where it's uh, attributable to it or had Russia just a due diligence obligation and the court remains totally vague about uh, this. Um, obviously there are also important contributions because 
on the substance, I think uh, the court is absolutely right. Uh, once we forget about the jurisdiction issue where I am with the court because of Bankovic, um, um, the uh, substantive uh, uh, application, at least to the second phase, is correct. Now, to conclude on the relationship between IHL and human rights law, in my view, the court avoided the main problem, and it avoided to say that IHL is the leg specialis on conduct of hostilities through its jurisdiction construction. Because by saying that there was no jurisdiction, IHRL, human rights law, did not at all apply. And therefore only IHL applied, and therefore we don't have any problem of interaction between the two branches. The problem with this is um, this construction wouldn't work on own territory. So if Russia had brought a case against Georgia, which is absolutely possible, and uh, Dr. Rizzini will uh, tell us about a very recent case where Ukraine brought against Russia um, about acts committed by Russia on its own territory. And this could also happen in an international armed conflict because an international armed conflict also occurs on most of the time, often, no, often on the territory of both states and uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, we will see this will occur. Then obviously the court must nevertheless clarify the issue of the relationship between the two branches concerning the right to life, because if it occurs on the territory of Georgia, the inhabitants of the territory of Georgia have a right to life. And uh, you cannot say they are not under the jurisdiction of Georgia. Um, and uh, I would insist that the, um, the court only made the nobiter dictum on um, on IHL in this uh, context. So the existence of IHL is not, as some people have said, the court said IHL prevails. No, it says um, paragraph 141, uh, the, um, after having uh, somehow bad conscience, uh, saying the court is sensitive to the fact that such an interpretation of the notion of jurisdiction in Article 1 of the Convention may seem unsatisfactory to the alleged victims during the active phase of hostilities in context of an international armed conflict outside its territory. These are limitations Marco will certainly come back to. Um, However, having in regard in particular to the fact that such situations are predominantly regulated by legal norms other than those of the convention, specifically international humanitarian law, the court considers that it's not in a position to develop its case law beyond the understanding uh, of the notion of jurisdiction as established to date. So, it, the, it, this is not in my, at least if we believe what they write, the, this is not a justification why they considered the existence of IHL is not a justification why they considered that, that uh, the victims were not under the jurisdiction of the Russian Federation, but simply a justification why they don't feel guilty and that these poor victims have nevertheless uh, some protection, but obviously, sorry for the ICSE, very little mechanisms to uh, protect them, at least no mechanisms which to which they can appeal. Now, I finish by saying on all other issues, there was simply no contradiction, even on the issue, because obviously for the torture of prisoners of war and of detainees and the education issue and so on, both IHL and human rights law foresee exactly the same thing, so no problem for us. On detention of civilians, obviously there could be a problem not on the treatment, but under ju ju for the justification of this detention. And here they make a reference indeed to the famous Hassan case, 
but they say the situation is different in the present case, given that the justification for detaining Georgian civilians put forward by Russia, namely to ensure security of civilians and not that of the power in question, is not permitted under Article 5 of the Convention or under the relevant provisions of international humanitarian law. Indeed, according to humanitarian law, the detention of civilians is permitted only if the security of the detaining power makes it absolutely necessary. And they refer to Article 42 of the Fourth Convention, which is a mistake uh, students shouldn't make in my course, because obviously this applies in home territory, while well, in occupied territory it would be Article 78, but okay, they are the European Court on Human Rights. And, and substantively, they are right. I mean, and the whole justice, so-called justification by Russia is ridiculous, because if you detain people to uh, protect them, you don't ill treat them. Mm. So, but this allowed to take Russia by its words, uh, allowed the court to avoid the only issue where a contradiction could have occurred, because as you know, and the Hassan case dealt with this, under humanitarian law, you may detain civilians uh, according to a procedure which would not be acceptable for is, sorry, under, uh, yes, under humanitarian law, you may uh, detain them under a procedure and for reasons which would not be acceptable under the European Convention. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Marco, for your critical analysis of the judgments. Uh, we, we, uh, we understood that even if we take the Bankovic position, uh, there are still uh, many problems regarding uh, the analysis and the jurisdiction made by the courts. And I totally share uh, your uh, frustration in relation to uh, the interplay between IHL and human rights law. Uh, it looks like a missed opportunity. At the same time, it was positive to hear your view that uh, most of the, the results uh, reached by the court are in essence uh, not uh, problematic and consonant also with, uh, with IHL. So let's now give the floor to Marco with AK, and uh, we are thrilled to hear your views. Well, thank you so much, Gloria, and, 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 and thank you and to the Academy and to, for inviting me and to, to all of you for coming. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to be with you. So I, I, I do not have to come out as a hater of this judgment. I, I, I really do not like it, but I, there are worse judgments out there on the other hand. So it's a very strange kind of decision the vast majority of the outcomes that the court employs you know, or reaches are, as, as Marco said, fine. You know? uh, and most of the, re the reasoning is, is, is unobjectionable and the judges are unanimous. It's actually a subsection of the case that's really about the use of kinetic force during what they call the stage of active hostilities that is a problem. Uh, and in that sense, the case is a very good comparison point to Bankovic. So Bankovic was about, you'll recall, it was about the bombing, I'm in Belgrade, it was about the bombing of our TV station here. And it was only about the use of kinetic force. It wasn't about anything else. Uh, whereas this case is about, about much more than that. Um, and even though Bankovic was a unanimous decision, this is not a unanimous decision. So on this one particular point, of jurisdiction not including the so-called active hostilities in the context of chaos during an international armed conflict, the court is actually divided 10 to uh, seven, uh, uh, yeah, yes, 11 to six, but in reality it is 10 to seven because one judge, Judge Serkides actually would adopt a different theory even though he voted for the, with the majority. So uh, in a sense, this is a case that tries to preserve the, the basic outcome of Bankovic, which is that if you simply drop bombs on people or hear artillery shells on people, the European Convention does not apply. On the other hand, it is far from being as restrictive as Bankovic was because all of the other human rights violations in the case that were alleged or proven are covered by the convention. That includes detention, even during the stage of active hostilities, 
and it includes a, a completely detached procedural obligation to investigate. So it's a mixed bag of a decision. Now, I would like to take a step back from this though. Um, this is, and then make the following points. This is not the decision that should be looked at in isolation. We should look at it in the wider context of the various different cases that the European court and other human rights bodies have been dealing with on this extraterritoriality issue. So that's point number one. And among these cases, the court this, you know, last week decided another such case, Hanan versus Germany, that deals with the investigation by German authorities into an airstrike initiated by a German colonel that who was part of the ISAF contingent in Afghanistan. Uh, and just a few days ago, there's a new interstate case brought by Ukraine against Russia that deals with extraterritorial assassinations. So again, not an isolated case. And just a week before this judgment, there was a big decision on, on the applicability of the convention to, to Crimea uh, because it was under control by, by the Russian Federation. My second point is that there's a huge conceptual difficulty here or confusion. And that's confusing the issue of how the convention applies in armed conflict with how the convention applies extraterritorial. Uh, the extraterritoriality issue is equally or even more so a problem in peacetime. Whereas the applicability of the convention in armed conflict is as Marco pointed out, very much a question also within the state's territory. If Ukraine is engaged in hostilities with pro-Russian rebels, it is doing so on its own territory. There is no extraterritoriality issue for any of the stuff from the perspective of Ukraine, right? If Azerbaijan and Armenia are litigating the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, as they are before the European Court of Human Rights, from Azerbaijan's perspective, everything happens on its own territory. There is no extraterritoriality issue. So in that sense, we should not confuse the applicability of the Convention on Armed Conflict with the question of extraterritorial application. So that brings me to the, the, my, my main point, my main disagreement with Marco. Let's take a simpler scenario. And that simpler scenario will show us why the court's approach in Bankovic and here is ultimately to be regarded as arbitrary. The scenario is one of peacetime extraterritorial assassination. State A sends an assassin onto the territory of state B to kill a person who's located there. So Marco, I don't know whether you're in France or in, in, or in Switzerland right now, but you could be in either. So imagine if France sends an assassin to kill you while you are teaching in Geneva, or Switzerland sends an assassin to kill you while you're in your flat in France, which is indistinguishable from Geneva in, in, in real life, okay? Should the convention apply in that type of scenario? When Russia sends an assassin or assassins to kill Alexander Litvinenko in London with polonium laced tea, should the convention apply? When Russia sends assassins in Salisbury to smear the Novichok nerve agent onto a door handle to kill Sergei Skripal and his daughter, and they end up killing a bystander, should the convention apply? When Chechen assassins, arguably working for the Russian Federation, kill a guy in Berlin, should the convention apply? Or to move to other treaties, when Kim Jong-un assassinates his own brother, Kim Jong-nam, at the airport in Malaysia, where he's killed at the Kuala Lumpur airport by a girl smearing a nerve agent onto his skin, should the ICCPR apply? When Saudi Arabia kills Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul, and then they chop him up into pieces, should the Arab Charter on Human Rights apply? Do you see what I mean? So an uh, extraterritorial assassination scenario, forget armed conflict, forget wartime. If we agree, and I think we must agree, that under human rights law, it is equally bad to kill somebody outside your territory 
as it is to kill them on your own territory, then from that position, it must logically follow that human rights law should also apply to more massive uses of lethal force, such as the one in armed conflict. So when Russia shoots down, allegedly, the MH17 airliner, even though this takes place in the context of armed conflict, it really has very little to do with the armed conflict, yeah? And when people aboard that, that plane are not just your normal civilians, but you have doctors curing HIV who are going to a conference in Malaysia, and they file, or, or the Netherlands and Ukraine file a claim on their behalf before the European court, should their right to life be protected? To my mind, the answer is unambiguously yes. I don't see how we cannot say that the ability to kill a person is not an exercise of state authority, power, control over the person, and thus jurisdiction as defined in the personal conception of jurisdiction. There is no, to quote Mr. Justice Leggett, who used to be a judge of the high court is now a judge of the Supreme Court of the UK, a principal system of human rights law cannot allow a result whereby if you detain Marco Sassoli and then shoot him in the head, the convention would apply. But if you just shoot him in the head from a sniper rifle, the convention should not apply. Or if you kill him by a drone, the convention should not apply. So that's my basic problem with this whole stuff. You know, It's one thing to say, Marco, as you do, there will be hard cases, there are border lines. Whenever you deal with any kind of rule, you, know, you will have hard cases. I agree with that. The issue is whether distinctions that are being made by the court and only by the court of all human rights bodies dealing with uh, these types of issues, it's only the European Court of Human Rights that does this stuff. The basic issue is whether the distinctions they're making are arbitrary or not. And they are completely arbitrary. They make no sense. The reason why they do it is not some kind of legalistic interpretation of the notion of jurisdiction. That's my basic point. We should not overthink this stuff. We should not think there's a theory behind this, that there's some kind of legal rule that one needs to interpret. And then reasonable people agree or disagree on what the factors should be in applying that legal rule. This is not like this. This is not the type of issue that we're dealing with here. This is a transparently political, policy-driven type of decision making. By the way, I'm not saying that as, as it's a bad thing. I'm not trying to say they are bad lawyers because they're engaged in policy-based analysis. All I'm saying is that's what they're doing. And that's exactly what the Bankovich court did 20 years ago. As I tell my students, the one thing they need to understand about Bankovich is the date when it was decided. And it was decided in December, 2001, after 9-11 had just happened as the invasion of Afghanistan was starting and the European Court of Human Rights was basically saying, we do not want to be the ultimate arbiter of the use of force by any European state that goes and invades somebody else. We don't want to do that. We find it hard enough to deal with all those cases against Italy about cases you know, of, of trials lasting for decades about some stolen sheep, okay? And we're drowning in these types of cases as it is, and we're finding it hard to manage this stuff anyway. And we certainly do not want to involve ourselves in deciding every use of lethal force abroad. That's the basic bottom line of Vankovich. And it's the same bottom line that the European court adopts here in Georgia v. Russia. That's all that it is. All the distinction it tries to manufacture in the case for example, the instantaneousness of an act, the proximity of the killer to the victim, none of them make any sense. All of it is simply designed to say to states and to litigants, please do not bring to us cases like these. That's the basic point. We do not want cases like Armenia, Azerbaijan regarding Nagorno-Karabakh or all the Ukraine stuff 
we do not really want to deal with them. We don't think we will achieve any good with these types of cases. And we are afraid of the political blowback we're going to receive, not just from states like Russia, but also from nice states like the UK who have been pummeling us for two decades now and are intervening in every case like this to send us a signal that they don't want us to interfere in your Afghanistan's, Iraq's, et cetera. That's what this is. That's how this type of case should be understood. I don't think this is necessarily, don't, don't get me wrong. It's easy for me to criticize them when I do not bear the responsibility of deciding these cases. If I was a judge on that court, maybe I would have felt the same. And these concerns about how do we gather the evidence? How do we apply IHL that we're not experts in? You know, how do we make sure that our judgments are actually followed? They are very valid concerns. My problem is with the court using Article One of the Convention, the notion of jurisdiction in Article One, as essentially a political questions doctrine, as essentially a way of carving out in a completely arbitrary fashion some human rights violations that the court really doesn't want to deal with. So that's my basic concern. Um, that's why I also think that this is likely not going to be a long lived precedent. Uh, it's not just because the court was actually split 10 to seven on the substance of this issue. It's also because who sits on that court changes all the time. So the, you know, the constellation of grand chambers change all the time. Uh, most of the judges sitting on that particular grand chamber are about to retire or have retired. Um, they are going to be faced very soon with cases like the MH17 or the new case brought by Ukraine against Russia on extraterritorial assassinations, where it will become very difficult for them to retain this kind of restrictive approach. So my guess, but my, certainly my hope is that soonish, in a few years, this particular judgment is relegated to, to history. Um, the way that should be done is very simple. The convention applies, but that's a different question from how it should apply. The fact that we accept that the convention applies to all most uh, uh, uses of force and other potential human rights violations in armed conflict does not entail that the convention should apply in that type of situation in just equally, you know, as it would in a normal peacetime situation. Those types of cases should be evaluated very flexibly. A state should get a lot of deference. The court should employ rigorous standards of proof and so on and so forth. And in doing so, it will be able to deal with many of these difficulties on the merits. And I just don't see how the court can ultimately avoid this. Note that now after Hanan, the court has effectively extended the procedural obligation to investigate to any kind of armed conflict situation uh, uh, in, in reality, the court doesn't say that, but that's in effect what it's doing. It has already said that every person detained will be covered by the convention. So all that's left is the substantive limb of the right to life. Now I agree with Marco, it's weird for the substantive limb of the right to life not to apply, but for the procedural limb to apply. The cure for that weirdness though, is to say, to acknowledge the substantive limb of the right to life applies as well. And if I was a, a, a military lawyer, a government lawyer working for any European state, I would not feel terribly happy with, with this judgment. On the one hand, it does preserve Bankovic, but it introduces so much uncertainty and adds all sorts of other things that I can no longer with confidence say to my commander or to my political official, you know, you, you go invade Iraq and don't, invade, don't worry about the European Convention. Every European state will now have to worry about the European Convention and eventually they will have to worry about the substantive limb of the right to life too. 
So I finish here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marco, for your presentation full of passion. Uh, and also for uh, explaining how uh, these uh, debates around Article 1 become uh, linked to a political uh, question or policy uh, question for the court. Uh, but Marco, rest assured that uh, the Academy and all the students are coming to, to protect you uh, in Geneva in case someone is trying to, uh, to attack you. <laughs> so now uh, let me give the floor to uh, Isabella. Thank you, Gloria, for the word. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, thank you, Professor Sassoli, to, for this invitation uh, to speak here. Um, I'm, I'm likewise very happy that uh, no one will be uh, able to throw tomatoes at me directly. Um, I just give you a, a quick overview of what I will be doing in the next couple of minutes. Um, First, I will provide a, a short overview of what these interstate applications are and um, also with a specific regard to the procedural properties um, that it has uh, and had a bearing on how now the Article 2 issue uh, was probably litigated and decided and also in view of the questions that I already saw in, in the chat room. Um, then um, the second point will be um, to sort of decode um, what the court did. Uh, most of this has been already covered. Um, and I would sort of uh, call this selective uh, systemic integration versus uh, the self-set goal of harmonious interpretation with uh, the norms of international humanitarian law. And um, then um, in, in my third point, I will deal with interim measures that refer uh, to various uh, sets of interstate proceedings. And I try to see these interim measures in the context of um, how the convention and international humanitarian law um, interact and um, what, what this might mean um, so to capture this relationship a little bit better, to try to see whether there are contradictions in the practice and uh, also probably um, contradictions between states that have different wishes, um, whether or not uh, um, international um, human rights law should apply to situations of conflict. Then in my last fourth point, I'll provide a short outlook um, on possible ramifications of this judgment for many other cases, uh, both interstate cases and also a lot of individual cases pending before the court. Um, so 15%, more or less 15, 17% of cases, um, individual cases um, pending right now before the court refer to interstate conflicts. So this is a lot of work for the court uh, on its docket. Um, so what are interstate applications to come to my first point in, in its procedural micro, micro universe? Um, it is important maybe to sort of point out that in the initial setup of the convention, the um, interstate application was a very minimum to what all member states were exposed, while um, the rights to individual petition and also the jurisdiction of the court were optional um, possibilities. Um, so the default mechanism for the supervision was um, interstate applications to the former and now defunct European Commission. Um, so we, um, that means also we have rather few cases that have been actually decided by the court because most of the cases that have been uh, before the Strasbourg organs were handled by the commission. Um, and I'll just uh, look briefly at the wording of Article 33 to make a point also about jurisdiction. So it says, Article 33, that any high contracting party may refer to the court any alleged breach of the provisions of the convention and the protocols thereto by another high contracting party. It does not say, it's worthwhile to note, in another contracting party, or it doesn't have a territorial sort of um, aspect in it. It says by another high contracting party that it doesn't say where this has to happen. So um, overall, I, I would uh, try to read uh, this Georgia versus uh, Russia 2 judgment not too much as a 
jurisdictional thing under Article 1, uh, but rather one that deals with the interpretation of Article 2 and other norms and their interaction with international humanitarian law. Um, I will try to explain this uh, in more detail in a, in a minute. So um, this provision is a broad entitlement. So the uh, jurisdiction um, in interstate cases is compulsory. Um, and unlike in the, for example, International Court of Justice, there are no further requirements such as a dispute. Uh, there's not uh, a prior requirement of negotiations or uh, other, other things that the uh, International Court of Justice has required uh, for the interpretation of, for example, compromissory clauses in human rights treaties such as CERT. Um, this is a remarkably easy access, so it's a very uh, nice forum. Um, it's um, then also coupled with rather few and low admissibility requirements. Um, I would like to underline, because it was already in the chat, is that the jurisdiction, so the subject matter jurisdiction of the court is limited to the European Convention of Human Rights, and it does not comprise on a formal level um, use at bellum and also not use in bellum. So this is, um, uh, of course, um, maybe something uh, too obvious, but I think it's worthwhile to point this out. So, of course, the uh, uh, court has repeatedly stated that the convention will also have to be interpreted um, in light of other obligations in international law, and it, it tries to do so. But um, the core takeaway message is so this is about the convention, the four corners of the convention. It is not about uh, trying to right every wrong uh, that is uh, sort of out there, um, even though it is one of the very few places that one can access uh, as um, in, in such um, in such contexts um, in the absence of other um, international fora. Um, so the few admissibility requirements um, uh, are, are basically the requirement to exhaust domestic remedies and um, the six month rule. There's only one case that didn't sort of make, uh, make it over this hurdle that was Slovenia versus Croatia. Um, and I would um, sort of dare to say that this is also because this is a rather special case, an intra-EU case, and also because the court had already said um, everything that it probably wanted to say about this in, inside of um, various um, individual cases. So uh, ra it's rather easy to access this forum, and there are rather few requirements um, that such an application has to meet. Um, I now focus um, on the exhaustion of domestic remedies a little bit because this has a bearing for the way that this um, Article 2 issue came before the court. I just try not to bore you completely. Um, I, I try to be uh, entertaining as much as I can here. So um, the, the rule, the, the, the requirement to um, exhaust domestic remedies does not apply if a state uh, um, has an issue with legislation. So for example, um, a derogation. A derogation usually comes in the form of some kind of legal act. Um, it is, can be a law or a decree or something like this. So a derogation per se can be the subject of an interstate application. Um, there is then no requirement to exhaust domestic remedies because there are no domestic remedies. And this uh, is also, of course, connected to maybe um, the reluctance of uh, states to uh, then also issue derogations because this might expose them to this kind of jurisdiction more and makes it easier for other states um, to actually um, bring these derogations before the court. Mm. Um, then the other big um, and for this case more important aspect are um, um, concerns the um, the administrative practices doctrine. So the exhaustion of domestic remedies um, is dispensed with if if the acts complained of um, are. Um, uh, sort of done with an official tolerance, so that if there is a systemic problem um, where then also national domestic remedies are ineffective. So this is important. Um, this was also how the, uh, the case was argued in Georgia versus Russia too. Um, and why is this important? So the consequence of this um, does come at a certain price. So this may means that the court um, has um, uh, 
to, to, to act like a court of first instance. So it has to engage in the fact finding that usually is undertaken by domestic courts uh, and domestic courts basically prepare cases uh, for the, the, the Strasbourg court to sort of hear only the legal issues. So this is um, basically the price uh, that, at which this comes. And the second um, very important consequence is that uh, the applicant um, must make allegations um, uh, about patterns of breaches and it is not sufficient um, to sort of say there is one thing that happened here, this was an isolated problem, so it is more like a global uh, issue that has to be shown. It, it, that sort of makes it a bit more difficult for applicant states to show that there is a systemic issue, uh, that for example there was um, a deliberate um, policy of uh, killing civilians. Um, that's, uh, that's a bit more difficult than sort of arguing maybe um, that some instances um, were somehow problematic. So this um, has this procedural background. Um, from my studies, I can sort of briefly add, I think that this fact finding um, is very important. Um, it's a very important function of the court. And there seems to be a lot of disagreement on the bench, uh, what, what, what one can see in this case about whether the fact finding methods available to the court are adequate or not. So Judge Keller uh, said, well, this is not adequate. Uh, and um, uh, Judge uh, Chanturia, I hope I, I say this correctly, the name um, said, um, well, we had more than enough evidence sort of to adjudicate also this five day uh, period. And, and um, sort of, I would personally add that probably this five day uh, so-called active phase is, is rather well documented um, in terms of evidence um, in contrast to, for example, more complex uh, cases that uh, deal with conflicts that expand over weeks or months or even years. So um, this is certainly um, a controversial issue that maybe underlies also now the way that um, this case has been decided in a rather strange mix of legal and uh, factual arguments why uh, jurisdiction could uh, not be established with respect to this active phase with regard to the substantive <clears throat> um, right to life. Mm. What I also find important to add here is that the interstate application as such uh, has no room for counterclaims. Um, and this was about what Russia did. And it was not a case about what possibly Georgia did wrong, maybe, perhaps there was also um, sort of uh, Georgian problems uh, with human rights um, that I, I don't know and I don't want to insinuate this, but um, this is a very important aspect. So this, the court was not called upon to sort of look at which party was somehow uh, doing what, but it was uh, asked to see whether Russia did something uh, wrong here. Um, we will see that the, um, the Armenia and Azerbaijan cases will be probably different from that because here we have uh, for the first time in history, um, two uh, states that have brought uh, uh, interstate applications and uh, Russia certainly could have done this too, but it has not done so. And also Turkey has not done so ever. So Turkey is another one of these usual suspects here. And there's also a current uh, reflection or reform process um, ongoing that um, uh, sort of touches um, a, a little bit on, on the jurisdiction of the court, but um, not, not on a central uh, way, but certainly um, there is a thinking about this interstate application going on from the fact finding aspect, because this is something that is uh, sort of using a lot of resources of the court and the court uh, feels um, that it is overburdened. Um, and so I, I simplify this now overburdened with, with these cases. Mm. Now coming to the substance, so, so to my second point, so what happened here in, in, in this case? So um, from what we know, um, and, and this I, I sort of read, read out of the admissibility decision, so there's 228 civilians that were killed and some 850 uh, dead people in total. Um, in, in the admissibility decision, the 
the judges said that Article 2 must be interpreted in so far as possible in the light of the general principles of international, international law, including the rules of international humanitarian law, which play an indispensable and universally accepted role in the mitigating the savagery and inhumanity of armed conflict. Um, so this um, sounds like a promise. It sounds um, in, in the admissibility decision, in substance, nothing was decided. Um, however, this sounds uh, like a promise and um, that Article 2 would in fact apply. Um, none of the judges that took the admissibility decision some, uh, I think almost 10 years ago now, were um, involved in this judgment now on the merits. And now what, what did the court do exactly in, 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 on the merits phase? Um, I would sort of now sort of call this selective systemic integration as opposed to the self-set ideal of harmonious interpretation um, of the convention with other rules of international law, because some facts, some issues were adjudicated also in the so-called active phase, while, while the substance of Article 2 was left outside. So there were uh, Article 3, so the right to be free from torture, and also the um, procedural aspect of Article 2, the right to life, uh, sort of was seen to be um, within the jurisdiction of the court. Um, and I also think that this um, rather selective and a bit arbitrary approach, which in, in substance, I think um, I would agree with Marcus Sassoli that uh, the, in substance, this is sort of an outcome that uh, sort of I could live with, but um, the way there is um, creates insecurity and uh, creates a lot of uh, also methodological questions that, um, and some of these questions I would like to, uh, to address here. Um, um, I, this is a bit like uh, this. I would also call this raising picking, picking, and uh, I have a further general observation here to make. So the court uses a lot of terminology from IH international humanitarian law. So it's it's talks talks about civilians and prisoners of war, and also uses concepts like international um, armed conflict, and somehow does not always has maybe its own uh, its own idea of what what these terms mean um, but um, this does not sort of uh, to a human rights lawyer that I am uh, sort of looks very coherent because they borrow concepts and, and um, then they don't sort of use however the whole legal package uh, that these concepts would entail um, they also refer to the court also referred to the armed activities case um, of the ICJ, where the ICJ said basically, so there's three types of uh, possibilities how to deal with um, this. So some rights may be exclusive matters of international humanitarian law, some others might be exclusively matters of human rights law, and others uh, sort of can be both. Um, so what does this mean now with both? And uh, is, is, is sort of splitting up Article 2 uh, into two sides and uh, ex exercising um, jurisdiction over one part and not exercising it over the other one, is this, um, uh, is this the third possibility or is this rather selective? Um, so I would uh, think, think that this is a rather selective approach um, and I would try to sort of find uh, <laughs> explanations for this. Um, um, and to sort of see how contradictory this is. So basically, um, Professor Sassoli has already uh, said, so, but I would like to uh, sort of say, uh, what, what does this mean? So the procedural side is something that they deem to be applicable. That means that Russia is under a human rights procedural obligation under Article 2 to investigate uh, the, death, the deaths um, in, in the conflict. And, um, and what, what, so what are then the legal yardsticks for this investigation? So first it is a human rights obligation. Uh, and then what are the yardstick? What is the yardstick to this? Do with, if Russia now uh, does uh, 
let's let's assume that Russia is is is, is doing investigations. Uh, which rules have to be taken into account uh, if, if for for the for the judging judgment about this? Is it IHL only, or is it then also? Uh, uh, Human, human rights law. So this is a very unclear way to sort of split this up. Um, and um, I come now to my third point to sort of try to see some of, some of the contradictions and also shed some more light on this relationship of the convention and international humanitarian law. So this uh, hum the, 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 inter uh, the interim measures um, have become uh, something um, part of a regular toolbox of the court when dealing with uh, this type of conflicts. Um, in this case, this was um, the first one of, of um, uh, three such situations overall. Uh, so in, in August of 2008, um, Georgia asked um, for interim measures and the, the court uh, decided to apply Rule 39 and called upon both, this is the main difference um, with the judgment, both Russia and Georgia to comply with their engagements under the convention, in particular with respect to Articles 2 and 3. So both um, and no distinctions about procedural or substantial um, obligations. Um, so in, in very similar manner, uh, in a very similar manner, this has been done in the same same way in the 2014 Ukraine uh, versus Russia context and also in the fall 2020 conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. Mm. So what do we make of this now? Um, the, the difference with uh, both Russia and Georgia is that the court could be sure that either Georgia or Russia was exercising at some point um, um, jurisdiction over this conflict, over the, the, the region in question. Uh, what do we make now of the wish um, as evidenced by both the request for interim measures and uh, also by the applications themselves um, of some states of Georgia, Russia, and both Azerbaijan and Armenia um, to apply Article 2 also in substance, as, 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 as I must assume, in the context of international armed conflicts, while only or mainly Russia, um, possibly also the UK, um, are, are against it. Um, state practice is, um, of course, a difficult um, source of treaty interpretation in, in human rights law. However, um, while usually um, the problems arise when states want to um, sort of make the scope of application smaller, here um, many states um, and many especially affected states have expressed their wish that Article 2 should apply in the context of such conflicts. Um, so this is um, a bit different from the usual problems that um, we, we face with this method of interpretation. Um, a preliminary question um, is then also which norm do we interpret here? And um, I would make the point that it is not so much an Article 1 jurisdiction issue, but rather one of uh, Article 2 of the Convention, the right to life. Um, it, and it, I would also uh, underline it is not about the modification of a treaty, so it's not subsequent practice, so it, it's about uh, the interpretation of an existing norm, Article 2, uh, which is already agreed um, by all states with their ratification, and um, the existence of Article 15, Section 2 of the ECHR is a strong indication, I think, of uh, the per se applicability of Article 2 also uh, in the context um, of armed conflict. And um, I, I sort of like to sort of look at the wording here too of, of Article 15, Section 2 that says um, no derogations are permitted from Article 2 except in respect of deaths resulting from lawful acts of war. So that means uh, the court could look at the question whether there are, there were, lawful acts of war. I, I think that is um, rather clear that this is at least a possibility for the court to review this. Mm. And um, I, I'd like to conclude this first part of the interim measure ar argument is that, so I think it is, uh, it is for the parties also to sort of see a treaty interpreted. It is not the only prerogative of the court. And I think the court should have 
in this uh, judgment, and it is a, there I see a missed opportunity. Have should have cleared uh, this this up, um, and it has not said anything about this. Um, um, a further attempt now, um, a second leg of the interim measure argument is an attempt to explain Article One, the, the finding on Article One, with um, the practice of the court. Um, uh, in, in terms of issuing interim measures in in the in the context of um, in the context of uh, these armed conflicts and whether there is a contradiction between issuing interim measures uh, with reference to um, armed conflicts and which is something that has been ongoing for uh, a long time now and also has been recently confirmed in the 2020 uh, context of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh or so how it is sort of to be reconciled that the court uh, consistently says uh, we, we sort of exercise basically jurisdiction, our jurisdiction say uh, both the states or the states involved, also Turkey was involved in the, the third set, have to respect the substantive um, right to life uh, in- Isabella, in I'm sorry to interrupt you, Isabella. Uh, yes. But uh, we have uh, 20 minutes uh, left oh, of yeah. the discussion. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, so I'm, would I'm, you I'm, like to, to add a sentence to conclude? Yes, so, certainly, certainly. Um, so um, I, I, I skipped this a little bit. So um, I, I basically said um, with, with the interim measures, um, uh, I think there are some, some contradictions here. Um, uh, for the court, I have to say, of, of course, um, the, the latest set of Nagorno-Karabakh problems have, has arisen after uh, the, the, uh, the, the judgment has been uh, taken that was in, in the summer of last year. And now a, a quick outlook of how, how, what, what this means. I, I would agree with Marko Milanovic that this case um, has to be seen in its, uh, in, in its very specific context. And I think that especially the Nagorno cases will require the court to um, deal with the substance of um, the Article 2 issues, um, and there will be no, uh, no way to escape this with using jurisdictional veils uh, to, to shed itself. All Thank right. you, and sorry for taking a lot of time. No problem. Uh, it's a fascinating issue, of course. So thank you very much uh, for your interventions. And for the discussion, uh, would uh, the panelists want to uh, respond to, to one another or can I open directly uh, to the floor? All right, because we received many questions. So thank you for uh, your proactivity. Uh, so I tried to put together a number of questions. And so one question that came up very often is about uh, the link with the Anan versus uh, Germany case. Uh, that deals with, uh, you know, airstrikes uh, in uh, Afghanistan, which uh, led to the killing of a number of civilians, and in the context of which the European Court of Human Rights uh, discussed uh, the procedural obligation uh, that derives from the right to life, so the obligation uh, to investigate. So there are obvious links between the, the, the two cases uh, in this respect. And um, we had a number of sub-questions uh, in relation to that case, I will mention one which I find particularly uh, interesting. Uh, one of the sub question was whether the court is actually uh, concluding that a state uh, has a jurisdiction in relation to the procedural obligation, when otherwise it would lead to uh, a gap of jurisdiction uh, in relation to the obligation to investigate. So would it be when there is a kind of exclusive jurisdiction of uh, the state uh, using force, let's say, uh, that the, the, uh, the procedural uh, obligation would, uh, would kick in. So that's just a, a sub-question, but if you can talk about the links and uh, uh, the, the precedent of Georgia versus Russia uh, in relation to the Hanan case, that would be wonderful. Who wants to start? Marko Milanovic, thank you. Uh, uh, sure. So, I mean, yes, it's, it's, it's a great set of questions, and, and there are obvious links between Georgia, Russia, and, and Hanan. Um, well, I mean, let's just sort of clarify what the court actually said and what, you know, what the, the normative position should be, like, what should they have said? I mean, let me tell you what I think they should have said. They should have said simply this. Whenever a state uses force outside its territory, the convention applies. So that would be my view, you know. The state always has the duty to refrain from using force without justification. So that's the substantive limb. And the procedural limb, whenever a state agent is credibly accused of using force abroad, 
the state has the duty to investigate. So when it comes to the conduct of its own agents, the state should always investigate in a convention compliant way whether the right to life has been violated. So that would be my view. So if you know Russia kills, forget armed conflict, if Russia kills Alexander Litvinenko in London or is credibly accused of having killed Alexander Litvinenko in London, Russia would have the duty to effectively investigate that killing regardless of the fact that it took place in London. Okay, that would be my view. Now, what does the court actually say? Well, the court says, relying on this Guzer Yurtlo judgment, the main purpose of which was actually to create a new obligation to cooperate between two states where the evidence for investigation or the defendants or the accused are located in two states. So that's actually northern and, and, and uh, part of Cyprus controlled by Turkey and the Greek part of Cyprus. You know, the court said, well, we need to look at special features. And they never really define what these special features are. And the whole idea of special features means that there's, you, you can never be sure what's sufficiently special. It's a completely flexible test that allows the court to find jurisdiction whenever it wants to and not find it whenever it wants to, right? So that's the sort of basic bottom line of that. Now, what do they do in Hanan? What do they do in Georgia, Russia? They say in Georgia, Russia, the fact that Russia obtained control of the territory, that all of the potential accused or, or the people who need to be investigated were Russian military officers or were within territories controlled by Russia, and uh, that Georgia could not do the investigation meant that special features existed, mm -hmm. coupled with the fact that Russia had the duty under IHL. In Hanan, Germany had the duty to investigate under IHL, Germany had retained under sort of the Security Council regime jurisdiction over its own personnel and therefore special features existed, okay? So when you combine the two, mm -hmm. you reach something very similar to what my sort of suggested model would be. I cannot imagine a situation where state A uses force on the territory of state B, whether with B's consent or without it in which some of these special features would not exist. Which means that effectively, whenever a European state goes on an overseas military adventure with Security Council mandates, without them, with consent or without consent, it would have the duty to investigate. The territorial state would never really be best placed to investigate. It would never have jurisdiction over the defendants. It could not have all the evidence. You know, the, 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 the state using force would have obligations and right, et cetera, et cetera. So, if I read this correctly, the bottom line of this is that in 99% of cases, the special features will exist. So effectively, you reach a very, very broad position on the procedural obligation to invest. Mm. All right. Thank you very much. Marco Sassoli, would you like to give uh, your perspective on that? Well, I agree on the analysis of the judgments. I don't agree, as you know, with uh, the ideal situation suggested by Marco. I can only repeat that I think one has to have jurisdiction before the violation occurred. And why am, am I so obsessed by this and would therefore accept that Switzerland does not violate the European Convention on Human Rights if they kill me in Ferney Voltaire, uh, but obviously violates international law. The question is, uh, is the European Convention on Human Rights violated? Um, it is, why should we single out the right to life? And now with the court and Marko Milanovic both agree that even positive obligations uh, uh, apply, well, why other human rights not? And then we come to something which is nice, human rights sans frontières. I mean, people die today in Somalia because something is done in Switzerland and therefore Switzerland violates the European Convention on Human Rights. I mean, morally, this is absolutely 
right, but please don't limit it to the right to life. It must be to the right to health. It must be to the right to food and so on. Okay, it's not in the European convention, but you understand my point. And I think it is like with genocide. If everything is genocide, then nothing is anymore genocide. And therefore it is reasonable. And I don't see another limit than mine, which is to say, you must be under the jurisdiction before the violation occurred. Now, on the procedural part, um, I would uh, largely agree with what Marco says. Uh, simply, he was slightly vague on uh, uh, when he said every time they use force, they have to make an investigation. Probably this is not what you wanted to say because we have to either apply the normal peace uh, time standard of the European Convention, and this is true for Litvinenko, but not for an armed conflict. In peacetime, it's not normal that people are killed. In armed conflicts, unfortunately, this is normal. And therefore, we have to find a standard uh, when an investigation has to, to be made. And if you say in an all out war, including Georgia, Russia, Russia should have made an investigation for every Georgian soldier killed or every uh, Georgian civilian incidentally killed in an attack against a legitimate military objective, then simply it becomes totally unrealistic. And therefore probably, which the court didn't say, but some people write that, and probably it would be a correct um, approach to say, Okay, in an armed conflict, and obviously in use of force, which has a nexus with the armed conflict, um, it is only when um, there are reasonable, there are reasons to believe that uh, a violation of IHL has been committed in that there must be inquiry. And this is the difference, Marco, but I know that you know that with Litvinenko. I mean, if there was an armed conflict, it might be lawful to kill Litvinenko. If there is no armed conflict, it was anyway unlawful. So- I, uh, Just to jump in, I completely agree with you. Yeah, okay. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, let me take another question so that we have a variety of uh, questions posed. Um, so a few questions went around the role of uh, Russia before 2008 in relation to the disputed territories. So um, basically the, the question is why did the court not take into account that role and potentially even effective overall control over the disputed territories uh, to decide the case? Why did it simply start the analysis as if nothing happened before uh, this 8th of uh, August. And if it did have uh, taken into account that, would that have changed completely the judgment of the court? Who wants to take that one? Maybe. Marcos, uh, Isabella, maybe we start with Isabella and then Marco Sassoni. Maybe briefly. So this, um, this criticism is something that is often uh, e expressed with um, the, the interest rate cases. So it is the parties that um, have the disposition over what the court is supposed to be doing. And um, if Georgia says, we will look at this case, um, we are alleging violations starting from um, 8th of uh, August, then that's what the court has to do. And it cannot uh, sort of look at what happened before. And it is also not the yardstick of the court to sort of look look whether which country sort of started the conflict or what who was responsible. Great, thank you very much, Isabella. Marco Sassoli, would you like to compliment? Well, I'm grateful to Isabella because apparently she knows whether Georgia made the argument. I didn't know whether Georgia made the argument. 
And then obviously it's absolutely right what you say, but I think it would have been relevant in the sense that it even reinforces my point that even during the conduct of hostilities, I don't remember the names of the different villages, but in some villages, there was before the hostilities, during the hostilities, and at the end of the hostilities, always controlled by Russia through South Ossetia. And therefore, I don't see how one could say no, but there was chaos and therefore IHL doesn't apply if by hypothesis an ethnic Georgian had been executed in such a village. So the distinction of the court is indeed absolutely impossible. Uh, especially in such a case where most of the territory was anyway already controlled by Russia through South Ossetia or by South Ossetia. And there, the ambiguity of the court is obviously regrettable, as I said, on whether there's attribution or there is just uh, um, uh, due diligence. Because for your question, uh, this is important because obviously Russian forces were actually present, except the famous peacekeepers, we could make a seminar about them, uh, only starting 8th of uh, um, August, while before the court should have clarified that uh, South Ossetian forces are attributed or not to Russia. Great, thank you. And I should specify that the, the first person asking the question in relation to that highlighted that the Georgian interstate application very thoroughly substantiated that the Russian Federation had effective overall control over this disputed occupied territories, etc. Yeah. So probably the court uh, knowingly decided not uh, to discuss uh, that point. Um, now, another uh, number of questions uh, turn around the role of uh, this uh, case, uh, Georgia versus Russia, whether it will be a precedent for other international uh, armed conflicts, whether it would uh, play a role in relation to uh, um, disputes and conflicts between Russia and Ukraine, Azerbaijan and Ar Armenia. So what will be the role of this judgment in your view? Will it completely shape uh, the way the court will decide those uh, ulterior cases or not? Marko Milanovic. So the short answer is nobody knows. I mean, nobody can know. Uh, the basic problem, the basic reason is, is that there's an enormous time lapse between filing an application, the, you know, the, the sorting out the fact finding, whatever, you know, happens, the oral argument, and then the, the actual judgment. So in, in, in this case, it was what, 12 years? I can't, I can't even remember. It was an enormous amount of time. And during that amount of time, judge, there is a huge amount of turnover on the bench. So uh, the, you know, the, 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 the normal uh, mandate of a judge is nine years, right? So even in the, the span of that one case, you, know, you, you, can, you can have the bench completely turned over. Even reg forget, you know, re regardless of the fact that of course, every grand chamber is basically a third or a bit more than a third of the full bench of the European court. And you, you don't know who's gonna sit where. So that's, that's the basic problem, or that's at, at least that's one of the problems. So if you look at, for example, the Hanan bench and the Georgia Russia bench, the Hanan bench was very, very cautious in not saying anything on the applicability of the substantive limb of the right to life. It simply said the fact that the procedural limb doesn't, does apply, does not entail that the substantive one does. And that's what enabled the, 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 the bench to be you know, 14 votes to three on this particular point. But if they were forced to decide the substantive point, you would have had much more disagreement. So I, you know, th that's unfortunately how it is. I doubt that it will be much of a precedent. Now, on the other hand, there's also the issue of how it was confined strictly to international armed conflict. Everything the court says, it confines strictly to international armed conflict. The same, by the way, thing that it did in Hassan, which was also not Hanan, but Hassan on detention, which was also confined to IAC. That means we have no idea at all what the court would do in a case dealing with non-international armed conflict. And as you know, 
even a cross-border non-international armed conflict like Afghanistan. And, and you know, that lack of clarity is deliberate uh, and it just in, it leaves an enormous, you know, amount of doubt by design. Great, thank you very much, Marco. Uh, Isabella and Marco Sassoli, would you like to add something on that? Maybe very briefly. So also predictions are always difficult about the future. What I sort of would wish that the court would do better in the future cases, um, and there are many, is to distinguish better um, who bears the responsibility to sort of know and establish who exercise jurisdiction where and when. So I think this is uh, unfortunate how uh, Georgia versus Russia too mixes this up. Um, and I hope that the future cases will be bringing more clarity on that. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's unfortunately already 2 p.m. I had many other very relevant and interesting questions. So I'm sorry that we were not able to discuss them all. Uh, but I would like to warmly thank our panelists. I felt very privileged that uh, the Geneva Academy could host uh, such a high level discussion on that case. I thank you very much for uh, your attention to you all, and I wish you a very nice afternoon and excellent weekend. See you soon for another IHL talk. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.